Muy buenas tardes a todos los que nos están viendo a través del satélite Amazonas o Internet Good en los diferentes países. To all those watching us Allá en the Palmira, Amazonas or the Internet, en la congregación que pastoré el reverendo Mario Villegas. En Palmira, en la congregación que el reverendo Mario Villegas pastores where the missionary Miguel Bermúdez Marín is, and also his wife Ruth, and our brother Harrison, and also our brother Ivan Sarmiento, he's with him there, and our brother Jairo Ordóñez, and everyone accompanying him, accompanying our brother Miguel, and this day is there in the beautiful Colombia. May God bless you greatly. I may these days there that our brother Miguel will be sharing with all the ministers and all the brethren there in Colombia be of a great blessing. Today, Friday, August 18 of this year, 2023, we will be seeing and hearing the topic All Things Under Heaven have their time. Preach on February 17, 2013 in Asuncion, Paraguay. And our brother William used the scripture, Ecclesiastes 3, 1, 2, and that same scripture on chapter 3, verses 14 to 15. Verses that we're going to read here in Ecclesiastes 3, verse 14. I know that whatsoever God doeth, he shall be forever. Nothing can be put to it, nor anything taken from it. And God doeth it, that men should fear before him. That which has been is now, and that which is to be had already been. And God requireth that which is past. And there he draws a little cornerstone, a cornerstone, and the ages. You may please be seated. He tells us in the message our true friend which was preached on June 24, 2002 in Monterrey, Mexico. He tells us, here our brother William is talking about the Book of the Seals He's talking about the Book of the Seals on page 565. And he says, Now we can see that even the message that the Reverend William Branham brings with which he foreruns the second coming of Christ is the foundation for what is going to happen. And it has to happen progressively according to how it was prophesied. Therefore, everything that is going to happen will be framed on and within what has already been said. In other words, everything that God will be fulfilling in what the Reverend William Branham foreshadowed, which is the mystery of the coming of the Lord, everything would be framed and will be framed in what the Reverend William Branham foreshadowed or presented, in other words, in the message he brought. That is why you find that portion that our brother William wrote where it says that the message has been given. Notice the message 
lo que contiene is what contains las the prophecies de las cosas of the Dios things that God would be fulfilling en in a new dispensation. Por lo tanto, Therefore, ahí nos mandó there he commanded portion, us in that portion, marcador, which we put it in a bookmark, he commanded the people to review no so that we do not miss the fulfillment of what the forerunner of the second coming of the Lord said, how the coming of the Lord would be at the last day in the fulfillment of that new dispensation and that new age that will come forth after the seventh age and the gap. In other words, everything that was spoken, let us see if you can pass it to me over here, everything that was spoken by no, the, the one he wrote, I also had it here in a the true word. I wasn't going to announce it, but look at how that came up. And everything that was spoken by the Reverend William Branham, which our brother William spoke to us in that introduction that we placed in the book of the different subjects of the tenth vision, the seventh seal, the sixth seal, the thunders, and all those subjects. Notice in the introduction that we placed on the front, there he tells us that all the content of the message the ministers and the congregations must have it so that we do not miss the fulfillment here it is the fulfillment of what was foreshadowed by the Reverend William Branham in other words when it would be fulfilled we do not miss it we do not miss the fulfillment of that promise because it would be so simple that if we do not watch, in other words, if we do not search and we do not have the message of Brother Branham and also what Dr. Soto spoke to us, then we would overlook it and notice. He says there, the true word, the message has already been given. And now to review what has already been brought, there is no other message at the summit of Mount Zion. Notice, there he's telling us and showing us that we have to review. We have to see that which was already spoken so that when that is being fulfilled, we do not overlook it. But the people without prophetic insight, they use that then to say, well, there is nothing else. Because they see things with human reasoning and not by revelation, which they are already destined to do that. And the chosen ones of God look and see that word, that message, they search it, and when it is being fulfilled, they say, this is what I was waiting for, because this is the fulfillment of what has already been brought by the forerunner, and also by that mighty archangel who also was placed in that gap, forerunning what would come later on a new age and a new dispensation being opened by a dispensational messenger who is the dispensational messenger of the 20th century, 21st century, 22nd century, 23rd century, 24th century and all centuries. 
because he is the final messenger of God. After him, no one else comes. That's what the angel of the Lord Jesus Christ was referring to when he said, no one else comes after that one because it is the angel of the Lord who has been working from age to age. In Paul, in Irenaeus, the angel of the Lord Jesus Christ in Irenaeus, in Martin, in Luther, in Wesley. In other words, in the Reverend William Branham, it is always the angel of the Lord working in the midst of the people of God, in and during the ages. And in the last day, that messenger will be in the midst of the church opening a new dispensation because while the dispensation of grace was open, that door was open, that messenger was not working in his ministry, but rather from his birth, from his infancy, he was increasing progressively. And at the same time, God was making that dispensational interlay. And when the door of the dispensational grace closes, then the one who is going to begin that new dispensation is already a grown-up. And notice how the dispensational grace closes. And God takes that mighty archangel who was speaking to the church bride, to the spiritual Mary, the things that that promised son would be fulfilling. And... Notice what he continues saying here. In the message that we are reading, and now notice the forerunner of the one who will come after the Reverend William Branham. Notice what the Reverend William Branham says. There won't be two of us here at the same time. He's reading from page 565 in the book of the seals. And let us have it open here. There won't be two of us here at the same time. And Brother William says, let's start a little before. It may be time, it may be the hour now that this great person that we're expecting to rise on the scene may arise on the scene. Maybe this ministry that I have tried to take people back to the Word has laid a foundation, and if it has, and if it has, I'll be leaving you for good. And Brother William says, like John, who after he went to prison, they beheaded him. He left the people forever, his followers, and he didn't appear until Christ completed his ministry, and Christ died and resurrected, and then the saints of the Old Testament resurrected. And the forerunner of the second coming of Christ said, If he has, I'll be leaving you for good. Therefore, he will never appear again in the body of flesh that he had. Notice when we see him, is when he is seeing the tenth vision. And at a moment, at a certain moment, because he wasn't before that, he was trying to come down and he couldn't. So there will come a time when he will be able to. That then pertains to the resurrection. And when the Reverend William Branham appears, it is already in his glorified eternal body, his glorified body, together with all the messengers of the ages along with their groups. Therefore, he will never appear again in the body of flesh that he had. When he appears again, he will be in the resurrection in a glorified and young body. After that, it's 30 to 40 days, and then we leave. It's the same thing with our brother William Soto Santiago. When he comes, those who are waiting for him to come to give the rapture in faith, they are going to find out that it has already been given. 
and rather there is where the weeping and gnashing of teeth will come. But wasn't there supposed to be a rapture in faith? What happened? That has already happened. That is in the past. He says, there won't be two of us here at the same time. See, if it is, you'll increase, I'll decrease. I don't know. But I have been privileged by God to look and see what it was. See, see unfold to that much. He will see many things. Now, there we can see that he doesn't know who he will be. And here again, he doesn't know who that friend that is with him on that narrow road is. And remember that it's on the narrow path that the great victory in the divine love will be fulfilled. There he is quoting to us in the book of quotations. There is a place where he tells us on page 54. which wasn't the same message but so that we have it and not read all that part later on you can look for it on this message our true friends there our brother William tells us that part there about those two translators who passed along the same thing to Brother Branham. Let us read that little part here on page 54, paragraph 464, it says, Because thou hast chosen the narrow path, the harder way. Thou hast walked of your own choosing. Now here, now this man, now watch how it's wrote. You can see it's wrote in foreign words. Thou hast picked the correct and precise decision, and it is my way. Bless God, it is my way. He said, because of this momentous decision, a huge portion of heaven waits thee. He had never heard about the vision. You see? Of this... You remember the vision, huge portion of heaven waits thee. What a glorious decision thou hast made, see, this in itself. Now here it is, from here on, I don't understand. This itself is that big parenthesis around it, which will give and may come to pass the tremendous victory in the love divine. I don't know what that means. This will may come to pass. Perhaps in the little tent one of these days, sitting back yonder, he'll make it known. And there, he makes some writings which we already have. At the bottom he writes, in the small tent, the tremendous victory in divine love. And at the top he also writes, small tent equals divine love. And in the message, marriage and divorce he also tells us of this part here of that great victory in divine love on page 6 he also tells us about this that happened it says on page 6 because thou hast chosen the narrow path the harder way Thou hast walked in your own choosing. Thou hast picked the correct and precise decision, and it is my way. Because of this momentous decision, a huge portion of heaven will await thee. What a glorious decision thou hast made. 
This in itself is that which will give and make come to pass the tremendous victory in the love divine. Now, the man signed his name here. The above statement was interpreted by three dots of Danny Henry prophesying over Brother Branham, given by three witnesses in the cafeteria in Los Angeles, California. He read that part. And he writes there, the tremendous victory in divine love will be in the tent. And also in the message, desperation. In paragraph 69, it says, If you said you love your wife and never tell her about it, and never sit down and make love to her, express it to her, kiss her, hug her, and tell her she's the best cook in the country, all the things that you know, and how pretty she is and how much you love her. If you don't do that, she'll never know it. That's the way. If you do love her, you express it. That's the way we do to God. When we love Him, we tell Him about it. We sit down and we adore Him and worship Him and see, love drives us to that. And he writes, if we love God. Now, what if something has got to be done with your wife? Why it not throw you into desperation to get it done? What if somebody says your wife's got cancer? What if somebody says your wife's got TB and she is fixing to die? Yet you, you do anything. See, it'll throw you into desperation. And that's the same thing that it is. We must have love before we can have faith. And when we have genuine love, what does it do? It pushes our faith out on the battlefront for God, see? Genuine godly love for God and for His Word and for His people will push faith out there. Love just takes a hold of faith and just come on, let's go. And out it goes because that's what love does. And he writes, he draws a cornerstone on the ages, and he writes, love toward God, and his people puts faith at the front. And he also writes, love makes faith work and will overcome the victory in divine love. Now, all of that takes a But Abraham says there the reproach for the word. Notice on page 12 to 13 of the message, the reproach for the cause of the word. It says, The word has always bore a reproach, page 12 to 13. All through the ages, God's anointed word has always been reproached. And that's the reason it's so hard for the people who doesn't understand would know how to accept that reproach. And he writes, the reproach. In other words, what did Brother Branham choose? As it says there in that translation of that language that was spoken, the prophecy there, he says, because thou hast chosen the narrow path or the hard way, the hardest way, see? The reproach for the word. And there he writes, the reproach. Can you remember the disciples returning back and rejoicing because they figured that they were counted worthy to stand the reproach of his name? He said, all that live godly in Christ shall bear a persecution, the reproach of the word. You always have to stand this reproach in order to give your testing 
to see. Every man that comes to Christ must first be child trained for the purpose that God has ordained you for. And remember, if you can just keep quiet, remember, if he has called you for this, there is nothing that can keep, keep it from happening. And he writes, bear the reproach. And he draws Star of David at the side. There's not enough devils in torment, but what God's word will be made manifest. You're born for a purpose, and nobody can take your place. And he draws another Star of David. God's word will triumph. He cannot fail. And there at the end, he draws a Star of David as well. And he read Revelation 19, 11 to 21, 10, 1 to 7, and 10, 8 to 11. In other words, that is the coming of the Lord. There is where every Christian ought to stand, knowing that, and trial will come up and seem very way to you. But remember, God has a purpose and it all will work right. That is, everything will work together for good for those who love God. Now, let's just call back a few of the events of God's Word being fulfilled and those who pack the Word in their age. Now, our brother William continues saying here, a little further on on this same message. And the great victory in divine love is promised for this end time after the seven church ages. Let us continue, he says. I don't know what that means. This will make come to pass, perhaps in the little tent one of these days. Sitting back yonder, he'll make it known. That is there in the message, standing in the gap, on page 33 and in the book of quotations that portion is there as well page 33 says in the message standing in the gap now here is what it said in other words here also he tells us about that occasion where that which was spoken there took place because thou hast chosen the narrow path the harder way thou hast walked in your own choosing now I can see that Moses had to make his decisions too see thou hast picked the precise and correct way correct decision and it is my way Underline my way, the Holy Spirit speaking back. Because of this momentous decision, a huge portion of heaven awaits you, awaits thee. What a glorious decision. Now listen close. What a glorious decision thou hast made. And he writes, in the sixth dimension, a huge portion of heaven awaits you. This in itself is that which will make and come to pass the tremendous victory in the love divine. And there he draws a cornerstone on the ages. And there he writes, love inside the cornerstone. And he writes, West America. And in the seventh age he writes, America. And below on the bottom part of the ages he writes, Israel and Asia Minor. And in the book of quotation, there is also where it says, let us look it up as well. That is in an excerpt from that same message. Let us see. Mm. 
It says on page 102, but be known to the church here and to the church hereafter. He also writes there, the church here and the hereafter. And in the church here, he draws the bottom part of the ages and the seventh age, he marks it. And in the church hereafter, he draws a cornerstone. If God pushes a man through a pipe, and he don't move at all until God tells him, there is no faith connected with it. It's God pushing you to something, and it's built the ministry to a place to where there is nobody can say one word against it. From henceforth, let me first speak to you in the name of the Lord before you listen, because I must go out by faith. I must do it by faith. Whether I think it's right or wrong or what, I do the best of my choosing and then go do it. And surely if this is itself a tremendous thing that will bring to pass and may come to pass, the tremendous victory in the love divine. And that's the verb before adverb. Then it's divine love, which is God. And he draws a cornerstone and he writes love. See, and then it takes the love of God to dash out there on the front line and stand in the gap for the people. Somewhere around there, it should have that part where it says, the tent. Now notice, That one also is the one we read at the beginning. It's 464. The one that our brother William was reading to us there. Now notice how he tells us here that it is that great victory in the tent where it would be performed, it will be carried out the great victory in divine love. And it is said that it will take place in a little wooden room that he puts there perhaps in the little tent and he writes 12 by 20. And also there he draws on that page 464, he draws a cornerstone and writes love. Our brother Munan goes on to say, all this of the great victory in divine love is linked to the third pool. And it is linked to the little room there in that big tent where there will be a little room that is a little wooden place to which people who will go for divine healing will enter and they will come out through the other door already free, healed. When he had the tent vision, he did not understand why in that little room. And those wonders were not taking place publicly. And the angel, being very scriptural, said to him, Does not the scripture say, Does not our Lord say, When you pray, enter your secret closet? Therefore, that place will be someone's secret closet. It will be someone's secret closet. But if it is someone's, it must be an instrument who is in the midst of the church ministering the word. And it will not be a public show. He says, when you pray, go into your secret closet and pray in secret to your Father, who hears you, who sees you and hears you, and he will reward you in public. Now remember, when was it that Jesus prayed to the Father before being taken prisoner and crucified? It was in Gethsemane. 
already adopted. It was in his body before that body was glorified. He prayed to the Father. It wasn't after he was resurrected that he prayed to the Father. It was a work done before. Someone cannot come with a glorified body to be studying and praying to the Father. Instead, all of that corresponds to a work before the resurrection. Therefore, our brother William continues saying, therefore, people will not have to see when he is praying for the sick. Instead, they will see the results publicly. And now, notice how that vision is interpreted by the scripture. The angel takes him to the scripture. And no one in history has ever carried out a ministry in such a reserved way. Although many times the apostles and angel messengers have prayed privately with some people. But carrying out the ministry in a private way and carrying out the ministering of that divine healing for the people, carrying it out in such a way like that has never happened in history. But it is promised to happen. And the basis is when you pray, go into your secret closet, and your Father who sees you will reward you in public. He will hear you. He will see you. And He will hear you there in secret. He doesn't have to be in public. And all of that, what is it for? So that there won't be a public demonstration, a public show and the imitators don't arise. Now, if he says that imitators can arise, then it's something imitable. It is something by which the devil can bring an imitation. But since the way will not be seen, then there the devil will not know what is here in the heart. Brother Branham says that as long as it's here in the heart, the devil can't hear it. But if he mentions it, he says that he sees the devil how he goes ahead and places obstacles after obstacles before he gets there. But if you have the revelation and you keep quiet, that is a different thing. That is between God and the person. The person and God. That is what will happen in that little wooden room. It will be between the instrument and God. And notice. Let us see here. In this message, words of greeting to the ministers on March 25th, 2009, in Jalapa. In that greeting, notice he's speaking about that portion. It says, what mystery is there? I will not tell you. You're going to, someday you will see it. Because it says that it's going to be something very private. And notice what is going to be fulfilled there, what Christ said. When you pray, go into your secret closet and pray to your Heavenly Father, who sees you. And He will reward you in public. Who sees you and hears you. And He will reward you in public. This message, I had it, but I didn't bring it with me. Notice, all of that, it will then be a place destined for a person. And that will be his closet or his office to either 
be studying and praying for the sick. That will be in that way. In other words, it is the place he has to study and then be able to come out and give the word. And or when all that is taking place, well, it will be in a certain way where this prophecy, this vision will be completely fulfilled. Now notice, look at what our brother William goes on to say here. Let us see where we left off. Mm -hmm, right here. He doesn't have to be in public. And all of that is for what? So that there won't be a public demonstration, a public exhibition, and the imitators don't arise. That is why Brother Renham says, there will be no imitation of this because the enemy doesn't know what it is. He doesn't know how it works because there will be no one who can see how that whole ministry will be working. And even the people who will come in, when they come out, they testify. They were asked, how did everything happen? That is, how everything happened? And people would say, I don't know how it happened. What I do know is that it happened. I received healing, but I don't know how it was. And this great victory in divine love, notice, Brother Branham says, it says, which will give and make come to pass the tremendous victory in love divine. I don't know what that means. This will come to pass, perhaps in the little tent, one of these days, sitting back yonder, he'll make it known which was the excerpt, page 54, quote 464 of the book of quotation, the excerpt of the message, the true Easter seal. Brother William continues saying, and now, see that also when he had the tenth vision, he saw that things were happening and he was not the one who was ministering. In the book of quotations, he writes that miracles and everything were happening before Brother Branham coming down, nor the angel. And even the altar call was made. And he was not the one who did it. And he even saw a person, he says, who was soft-spoken and he did not know him. Now, we can see that something great is appointed. And therefore, it is a prophecy to be fulfilled. And in the tenth vision, see, when he explains it in the book of the seals, when he explains the third pool, he says that the third pool is the sword in the hand. He also says that the third pool is also what he saw in the tenth vision. All of that is the third pool. And the thunders reveal the mystery of the seventh seal. The whole third pool is under the seventh seal. What is the third pool? The fulfillment of that tenth vision. And notice what he writes here. In a writing, it says, Faith in the vision of the tenth cathedral and the rapturing faith which is given by the seven thunders of Revelation 10, 1 to 11, 11, 1 to 14, 6, 12 to 16, 11, 15 to 19. Faith in the vision of the tenth cathedral. In other words, the rapturing faith where as Brother William says, it will be given in the fulfillment of the tenth vision. He goes on to say, he says on one occasion while praying, he says, further down on the same message, and when it comes to the 
time that I must lay down and I get down to the river and the waves begin to come in. Oh God, may I be able to hand this old sword over to somebody else that will be honest with it, Lord, and will pack the truth. That is in the book of the seal, so you can have it there. Also in the part on page 571 and there he places in that excerpt hands his sword over to someone else who is honest he writes there Moses and Elijah the angel of Jesus so notice it continues to be the angel of Jesus because it is that angel who has been ministering from age to age in each messenger and he will be incarnate at this end time fulfilling the prophecies of the tenth vision that is why when he said in the writing when you see I don't know if that was written or spoken I believe it was, here it is. It was written. This one was written. The first was in an audio, then this was written. When you see that prophet messenger of the seventh seal, you will be seeing the coming of the Lord with Moses and Elijah. There he is saying how the prophecies of the third pool would be fulfilled in the tenth vision. How? Well, when you see that messenger carrying out that work, fulfilling the prophecies of the third pool in the tenth vision of the great tenth cathedral, you will be seeing the seventh seal. You will be then seeing the ministries of Moses and Elijah. And then there he says, and there you will see me again. Because it is there after the end of that stage where Brother Branham was seeing everything. He came to a certain moment when he came down and the angel also came down with him. They came down there to the little room. And there in those days is when we will be seeing our brother William Soto Santiago again with us. Brother William said, after reading that part, he said, and his time came, the wave, the time of his departure came. Therefore, the king's sword, which is the word, has to be somewhere. He said, may I be able to hand this old sword over to somebody else that will be honest with it, Lord, and will pack the truth. In this same message, standing in the gap, on page... 16 notice what he says here he says how that he sent me out first and the first gift and the second gift and the things that's been said or done the world over and literally millions have come to Christ and tens of the thousands of preachers inspired that started a revival that swept the entire face of the earth today and being that the Pentecostal was the one who received my message they was the one that gained ground the Pentecostal church shows more convention in the little groups of Pentecostals than all the rest of the churches put together that's statistics why? because of them receiving truth and receiving the revival and he writes the revival and on the front he writes, referring to that page, a revival is received by those who receive the truth. In other words, notice, the ones who are going to receive that revival are those who receive the one who will be packing the truth. Where Brother Branham says, I pray and may God grant that when the waves come upon me, I may hand this word over to someone else who can pack the truth. 
and that truth is the revelation of the seven thunders, which is the final revival, which contains the rapturing faith. Now notice also in the message, possessing all things on page 22, where it says, a little part here, it says, God, let me pull this sword. Let it sparkle and shine and march forward. Let my will be in the back and his word going in front like that, a sharp to its sword making a way. And he writes, the sword. Notice how what's being reflected in him the one who would pass the truth, opening the way. Opening what? Opening a new dispensation. That is, opening that way toward that new age, the age of the cornerstone with the two-edged sword. In other words, a man who has the sword is required in order to be able to open that new dispensation. In the message, the unveiling of God also tells us on page 37. Here he tells us on that page 37, he is saying many important things. Let us read page 37. He says, Now, what if a fellow refuses to see the sun? Say, Oh dear. I know God said, let there be light, but there is no such a thing. I'm going down in the basement. I just refuse to see it. The guy is crazy. There is something wrong with him. And there he writes, he who doesn't want to see the light is crazy. He is in the fifth dimension. There is something wrong with a man or woman can see the promise of God and see it manifested and then refuse to believe it because the denomination pulls the veil down. They stay in that past age and then the veil remains on their face placed by that denomination they make themselves because in the age of the cornerstone and dispensation of the kingdom they will not denominationalize there those who go backwards are the ones who do it and if he or she is in that age of the neck where we used to be because potentially we were in the cornerstone going through those stages but in the dispensation of grace and that sounds like uh, as if it is something incoherent remember that the dispensation of grace and the dispensation of the kingdom were being intertwined and all of that happened in that time in that gap where the forerunner was and where the Archangel Gabriel was in clearer words where the Reverend William Branham was and where our dear brother William Soto Santiago was. Now, once the Reverend William Branham leaves, where did many people go? To the seventh age. And others have stayed there. And Brother William leaves. And where have many people gone to after his departure toward the seventh age? 
in the stage of the age of the cornerstone potentially. And others have ascended to that new age, the age of the cornerstone and dispensation of the kingdom. Now those who have remained in the seventh age, notice they have turned back and they are in that place where the devil reigns. That is the throne of Satan, Laodicea. Now notice how they cannot see because of that veil. In other words, neither through the veil that is put on them. And they cannot see through that veil. Didn't they say back then, we don't want this man to reign over us, see? They stumbled over that veil, and they could not see what was behind the veil. He goes on to say, in order to do this, our denominational traditional veils must be broke by God's spirit of fire and sword, which is his word. Always his word is his sword, see? And he took his sword that day full of fire and ripped that veil from top to bottom. He does the same thing with the same sword today. No, my creed, my book of creeds, my catechism, but the sword of the Lord, see, rips the veil down. And you see God standing in plain view, manifested in his word. What a glorious view to look at, see? All right, God's Holy Spirit and fire, his sword rips it. The word rips the denominational veil. Well, if you just say the word and the word don't work, what good would the sword be here and say it can't rip? Say, uh -huh, and it won't rip? But when you lay that sword of God up there and watch her rip, there he writes, the sword and a star of David. She is held by an ordained hand sent to do so. See? rips it open, and there he is. There he shows God plainly in view, the great Jehovah. That is his word made manifest, the portion that's promised to the day. Do you get it? See, when the sword promised of today is in this day, what's supposed to be, and God takes his sword and rips down the denominational veil and pulls it back and manifests himself and shows that he is there. Still that same pillar of fire. Notice that is the word made manifest for today's promises. Our brother William goes on to say here, and he who has received that sword will be giving the people the truth. He who has received that sword will be the instrument of Christ. And under the ministry of that instrument, the third pool will be fulfilled and the tenth vision will be fulfilled. It cannot be said any clearer on the what ministry and in what instrument will God fulfill the third pool under the one who receives that sword. And it has to be an instrument, a veil of flesh, in whom God is fulfilling that promise and is fulfilling what he promised in the corresponding stage in which we are. Notice, for Jesus to be resurrected, he had to be adopted and resurrect on the third day. For Moses and Elijah to be resurrected, they had to be adopted first and have eaten the book. 
neither Brother Branham resurrected on the third day, nor did Brother William resurrect on the third day also. Notice what he continues saying here. It says, page 573, it says, in the book of the seal, now, did you notice on the opening of this seventh seal, it is also in a threefold mystery. I have, will speak and have spoke that it is the mystery of the seven thunders. The seven thunders in heaven will unfold this mystery. You'll be right at the coming of Christ, because Christ said no one knew when he would return. This is on page 573. Let us see what he wrote there. We read of the book in Spanish 479 and 481. It tells us this is on that on those pages. And on that little part there, he writes, the three purposes of the seventh seal. In other words, just as the sixth seal has its three purposes, so does the seventh seal. And he writes, the seventh seal is the mystery of the seven thunders. And he writes, silence, half an hour. In other words, that will be as long as that silence lasts, as Brother Branham says. In other words, that fulfillment is as long as that half hour of silence lasts, which we are going to read a part there where he wrote that as well. In other words, if the half hour of silence in 2009 said that he hadn't yet begun, he says that the half hour of silence has not yet begun, but it will begin. Then this prophecy hasn't been fulfilled yet. No one can say that Brother William was preaching the thunders and giving the rapture in faith because that happens within the half hour of silence. But notice, and they will be able to find many messages where he has said and spoken this way. But now we're going to come up to that, the reason for all of that. Notice. Further down he says, you see, they hush. Nothing takes place then. Angels don't know it. Nobody knows when he's coming. But there will be a seven voices of these thunders that will reveal the great revelation at that time. And further on the same message that I'm reading, our true friend, Further on, he says, as they impersonated what God did through our brother Branham in the first and second pool, the third pool cannot be impersonated. No one will manage to make an impersonation. Why? Because they do not know what it is. Therefore, it will be fulfilled as it is promised. There will be no imitators. Impersonators are imitators. And he quotes there because he had already announced it that he was going to read that from page 556. He says, he'll try to impersonate everything that the church will do in the Book of the Seals. He tried to do it. And there in that part he writes, the seven ages. In other words, the devil has done that in the past, that is in the seven ages. We notice it through the Antichrist. But this is one thing he cannot impersonate. 
There'll be no mimics to this, see? Because he don't know it. There is no way for him to know it. He's the third pool. He just knows nothing about it, see? He doesn't understand it. But there is a secret laid beneath that. Glory to God in the highest. I can never think the same the rest of my life when I sin. Now, I don't know what three dots. I know the next step there, but I don't know what, how to interpret that. It won't be long. He knew what the next step was, so he was setting the foundation, preparing the way for what would come after him. What comes after the forerunner is the next step. God's next step. I've got wrote down here when it happened. If you can see here, stop. Go no further than this right here. And he read from Brother Branham and Brother William said, Now in that notebook with notes, there must be something very, very important related to the third pool. And here, stop. Go no further than this right here. Here, from what we can see, the Spirit of God is speaking through him. He says, let me read it all together again. Here, from what we can see, the Spirit of God is speaking this through him. He says, I'm not prone to be a fanatic. I'm just telling the truth. But you remember the little shoe that I always try to explain how that the soul laid next to so-and-so and the inner conscience and all that kind of stuff, which, which it only made a big bunch of impersonators start after it, that is the imitator who they have to take up the hand and hold the people and have vibration. Everybody had vibrations in their hands. And Brother William says, that is, others appeared with vibrations in their hands too. Everybody had vibrations in their hands. But you remember when he took me up there and said, this is that third pool and no one would know it. You remember that? Visions never fail. They are perfectly the truth. It is like when Brother Branham saw that consolation. On Sunday, we have a subject about the sign of the Son of Man. But notice how we have been speaking on these days that each one of the chosen ones have been in the whole work of God since the creation. When he was lifted up, that angel who lifted up the Reverend William Branham, there you can say, I was there. See? At that time, he was in 63, in that retreat. We were there. And when all that happened at that moment, and everything we already know about what was being carried out there in that great summit, all of that represented what God would also be carrying out in the age of the cornerstone above at the top. And we were there. But the whole group could not be there. But instead, one person was representing us. That was the angel who was different from the rest. And there, in that spiritual retreat, was our brother William. In that place there, in Lares. Now notice how God was showing in all of that what would be carried out, being fulfilled in the midst of the church, in the fulfillment of the tenth vision. Because there, the pillar of fire was speaking to someone above from where he was. Now, all of that was being shown there in that constellation of angels, what God would be doing here on this planet Earth. Because notice, 
He continues saying, But you remember, when he took me up there and said, this is that third pool and no one will know it, you remember that? Visions never fail, they are perfectly the truth, our brother William said. And every vision has to be according to the word. It has to be according to what God has promised for the time where some visions is given to be fulfilled. In the message, Jesus lost, sought and found in the temple, preached on October 26, 2002 in Bogota, Colombia. He tells us, well, the fourth generation, we are in the fourth generation of the church, in the fourth generation of the church that has been restored. First generation, in those restoration stages, the Lutheran age, in the second age, the Wesleyan age, the third Pentecostal age, and the fourth, the age of the cornerstone. The age of the word, that is the fourth generation. In the book of quotations, on page 30, on paragraph 255, or 251, page 30, paragraph 251 says, He says on that part there, continuing, it says, What's the matter? We're at the end, another age. As soon as one revival is over, God raises up another and throws more light. Just keep moving like that. Now we're at the end of this time. Each man has looked at the end of his junction for the coming of Christ. But they had a lot to look forward to. The returning of the Jews flying saucers in the skies and the things that we see today. But we are at the end. We are here now. Now, the Spirit of God has worked under justification under Luther, sanctification under Wesley, the baptism of the Holy Spirit under Pentecost. And here it is in the last day, performing and doing the very same things that he did when it was in Christ. What is it? The church in Christ has become one. And he just a cornerstone there. And as soon as they connected together, that last link, and he just another cornerstone, she'll go through the sky shouting, up will come Wesley, Luther, and all the rest of them back in those days there. He that first will be last, he that's last will be first, and there will come the resurrection. Where? Up there, in the cornerstone. He goes on to say, first generation of the restoration time, first generation Lutheran, second generation Wesleyan, third generation Pentecostal, and fourth generation of the Word, the age of the Word, the age of the cornerstone, the age of the head. That is the fourth generation of which God told Abraham in Genesis chapter 15, they will return here, it will be restored to its land, and we will be restored to sons and daughters of God in eternal, immortal, incorruptible, glorified bodies. And we will enter the promised land of the eternal and glorious and glorified body, equal to the glorified body of Christ our Savior. In the message, this great warrior, Joshua, on page 14, he tells us, Look, at the reason they refused it, they journeyed 40 years longer in the wilderness because they refused it. What's kept all these things? I believe the coming of Christ 
it on my heart. I might as well say it. The coming of Christ is past due. Past due. You say, preacher, what are you talking about? The Bible. As it was in the days of Noah, so will it be in the coming of the Son of Man. As it was in the days of Noah, and they were 120 years. And there are some writings of dates of which I will not mention. Notice. In the days of Noah, God was long-suffering, not willing that any should perish. God is long-suffering. His coming is past due. We have went into the millennium 40 years ago, if the people would submit themselves to God. But instead of that, they pulled back and organized and tightened down. Even the Pentecostals and all the rest of them under the old system. We'll have a church, we'll join the church, and we'll see if we can get more members than them. And one raised up in the bunch and said, you know, I believe Jesus is not coming on a white horse. He's coming on a white cloud. He goes over here and makes him an organization, gets a few in it. It is like when they say, no. Brother William was given the title deed because he was preaching and he was saying that he had the title deed and he was speaking the content of that title deed and he's the one who has it. See? They form a doctrine and form and it takes many. But we're going to talk a little bit about that now. How is he going to have the title deed? If the title deed is taken when the last chosen one enters, otherwise there will be no intercession in heaven and there wouldn't even baptisms or altar calls would have been needed which corresponded to the dispensation of grace. So how are you going to say that he has the title deed? Then the divine judgment would have been falling a long time ago if the title deed was given to him back in 63. I'm amazed at your degree of wisdom. Not even by, let us say, by logic or common sense. How are you going to express something like that? which a pastor or a minister will be inculcating knowledge and words or something to the people. And he will be accountable for it because he's sowing a faith that is not correct. He's adding to the word. The title deed was taken after the dispensation of grace was closed. And it couldn't happen before that because the half hour of silence was not yet in operation. The half an hour of silence would be carried out when he rose up from the throne of intercession, which in 63 had not happened. All of that was showing what God would do later on. And God was reflecting and typifying in the messengers of the ages and also in the forerunner messenger, William Marion Branham, and also in our brother William, what he would be doing when he rose up from the throne of intercession. One says, you know, I believe we ought to be baptized like this. Someone would say, and he make him an organization. Other one said, I believe we ought to be baptized forward. He makes him an organization. They start to invent things and say things and interpret things about what the messenger meant to say when it is about seeing what the messenger said being fulfilled before them. 
the fulfillment of what they prophesied, when it comes to be fulfilled, then they don't believe it because they overlook the simplicity of God. The same old wordly system. But God in these last days is calling out of chaos out of the midst of all of it. Man can't do it and never will do it. But Christ himself shall come and shall call. Christ means the anointed one. We'll cross Jordan then. We'll cross Jordan. Now look at them. There they was, sitting in the wilderness. Here was the evidence back. Why did he believe they could do it? Why? Moses said. I mean, God said to Moses there from the pillar of fire, he said, Now look, I give you Palestine, it's yours. I'll give it to your father Abraham. And I told him that you all would sojourn down there. And I want you to notice another thing. How many generations it took to bring it up? Fifth, 40. 50 years is a generation considered in the Bible. 400 years, thou make eight generations. And he writes eight generations. And he writes, he draws the cornerstone and the ages. And above he writes eight in the cornerstone. Notice then, the first thing you know, Moses come up and they backslid, went away another 40 years. They come up to Palestine another 40 years, 10 generations, meaning the 10 tribes, and the half tribes, of course, to split time, to take it over, perfectly how they got all the words inspired. Not one word, but what's inspired in the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. And he writes, this generation shall not pass. Then they come to Kaddish, where they could be judged. Now, the church come to Kaddish, where they could be judged. Then the churches all set and counseled here a few years ago. Could we consider this baptism of the Holy Spirit? Could we consider the gift of the Spirit returning to the church? I'll tell you what it would do. Our documents draw up like this. We cannot move to it. The next one said, we cannot receive it. Others said, we cannot receive it. But there were some people said, went over into the promised land and come back with the evidence of it, that healing was right, that the Holy Ghost is right, that the powers of God is right, and the very promised land we're promised is right. Yes, sir. And there he writes, Gene, that generation, that is the product of genes. Our brother Branham continues saying there what God would be doing with Joshua. In other words, the same thing he did with Moses. He says there, as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. And brother Branham continues there. Now, our brother William continues saying here, for the world as well, notice, when the Hebrew people entered the promised land, it was the fourth generation. For them, the fourth generation to inherit the promised land, to inherit the inheritance that God gave them and promised Abraham for his people. And it was also a time for judgment for those who inhabited those territories. Therefore, the fourth generation is also a time of judgment for the kingdom of the Gentiles. And we will leave it there. On page 53, notice why didn't it happen in the generation from 46 to 86? The divine judgment did not happen to the kingdom of the Gentile. In other words, back then, it would not be entering the divine judgment 
for the day of vengeance of our God to be preached to the kingdom of the Gentiles. Let us see here on page 53. Notice. On paragraph 457, it says, Somebody said to me the other day, Can you stop it? I said, No, sir. He said, Well, what do you do? Why don't you keep still? I said, How can I keep still? I'm coming to a judgment. And my voice will be, and he writes, it will be in the fifty lacha. There at the top he wrote that. I'm coming to a judgment, and my voice will be on the recording there, thou scrape the whole generation. I'm coming to a judgment, he writes, it will be in the fifty lacha. And it says, on the recording there that scraped the whole generation, and at the end he writes there, judgment. And above there, the whole generation, he writes, of Laodicea. The kingdom of the Gentiles. And at top he writes, the judgment in the age of the cornerstone, the ministry of judgment of Revelation 11. Where? Notice, and he writes, it will scrape this generation. Which is the judgment ministry of the age of the cornerstone? Revelation 11, the ministries of Moses and Elijah. In the message, the indictment On page 29, it says, O oh my, how rich this is to me, see, to see and know that it's the truth. I'll stand by this. Let the God of heaven will rise up, and my voice will be on the magnetic tape of God's great time yonder, and he will condemn this generation in the last day. And he writes, Revelation 11. And he writes, by what WMB said, that is William Myron Branham, this generation will be condemned. Notice, through the message brought by the Reverend William Branham. And there we can say, see, that the message was given. The one brought by the forerunner and the one brought by Dr. William Soto Santiago. Now we are seeing, living in our own flesh, the fulfillment of what that message was given to the people. In other words, the content of that message is this that we are living today. The reality of what was brought by the forerunner and by our beloved friend William Soto Santiago. And there he writes, the voice of the prophet will condemn this generation on the final day, in the last day, with Moses and Elijah. And on page 42. On page 42 of Souls That Are in Prison Now, He tells us 
page 42 of the message, Souls That Are in Prison Now, we say. Again, also in Genesis 15, 16, he told Abraham over in the land of the Amorites their iniquity. Now, they were Gentiles now. I can't take you in there right now because the iniquity of the Amorites, the Gentiles, and he read Gentile kingdom, is not fulfilled up yet. But I will judge him. And he writes in Moses, I'll come in the fourth generation. And he writes, Roman Empire at the feet of iron in the fourth generation. He writes that before. And afterward, he says the fourth generation, he writes, the age of the cornerstone for the chosen ones. And then I will judge that nation with a rod of iron. And he writes there with Moses and Elijah. Has it been so long that God's long-suffering, the ministry constantly through tapes and everything else, has combed across the world to see if there is one more? There are top in between before the paragraph he writes, Revelation 11, 3, and Revelation 19, 11 to 21, and 2, 26 to 27. Let me read it again. After that writing, he begins the paragraph, Has it been so long that God's long-suffering, the ministry constantly, through tape and everything else, had combed across the world to see if there is one more? There in between, he also draws a cornerstone and the ages, and he numbers the last three, one, two, three. And above, on the cornerstone, he writes, four and numbers each one of them as well. Luther Wesley and Laodicean age. But maybe that last one come in just recently. Has it been the iniquity that's been so long? If Jesus is the same, which he is, Hebrews 13, 8, his message must be the same. His action must be the same. If the first and second pull is without question, is there a question in your mind about the first and second pull? Did it come to pass just like he said? Then, why question the third? See, why would you question it? The first two was identified by the Scripture. I proved to you this morning that the third is identified by the Scripture too. And he writes, the third pool. And that is what our brother William spoke there, which we read, where it says that that vision is identified in the scripture. That's what we read. And every vision has to be according to the word. It has to be according to what God has promised for the time where some vision is given to be fulfilled. And before, also, when the angel told him that it is scriptural, that that vision, let us look it up quickly. Where he says that it is It is right here, it says. And now notice how that vision is interpreted by the Scripture. Notice, it is by the Scripture. Now, Brother William continues saying here, the world doesn't know in which generation they are living in before God. But notice, in which generation we're in. Now, why didn't certain things happen in the time of our brother Branham? Because we had not fully entered the fourth generation yet in the message of rapture. He tells us 
on page 9. something else like in the middle it says another thing if those disciples had faked him like that why did each one of them die in martyrdom and even apostle peter said turn my head upside down i'm not worthy to die like him how they took andrew and turned him sideways on the cross they everyone sealed their testimony in their own blood they believed him and loved him and gave their life for him. If he was a faker, how would they even done that? See, the spiritual application. The people don't get it. And he writes, they don't get the spiritual application. In other words, they do not get that which is being carried out through that messenger at that moment. And they put it and placed it as something physical there, being fulfilled there. And they do not see it, and they do not apply it in the spiritual realm because they do not have the prophetic insight. Everything goes into reasoning. and also in the message. God's power to transform, it tells us on page 14. Notice what human wisdom is, human knowledge, because our brother William goes on to say, anyone may think, was Brother Branham wrong? No, it is because everything has its time. Now notice how everything has its time. And many times they do not understand when it is being spoken, when the messenger is speaking about himself or when he's speaking about someone else. Wasn't that what the Enoch said to Philip? Was it? He sees that he's reading the book of the prophet Isaiah. And let us read it. Where he says to him, Do you understand what you read? Now notice something very important. In Acts 8, it says, on verse 26, says, And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise and go towards the south, unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem, unto Gaza, which is desert. And he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, an eunuch of great authority on the Candace queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasures, and had come to Jerusalem for to worship, was returning and sitting in his chariot, read Isaiah the prophet. The Spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to that chariot. That is, he went ahead to come closer there and see. And Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah. In other words, notice. He was listening because the Ethiopian was speaking at loud voice there in Isaiah 53. And Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? And he said, How can I, except some man should guide me? 
and he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. The place of the scripture which he read was this, he was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and like a lamb dumb before his shearer, so opened his, not his mouth. In his humiliation his judgment was taken away, and who shall declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee of whom speaketh the prophet this, of himself or some other man. Any follower of Isaiah of that time, after Isaiah left, would say no. Let's say that the part about Jesus was fulfilled right then, let's say, after Isaiah left. Isaiah left, Jesus comes, the fulfillment of that, we're putting an example, and that believer in Isaiah comes, and he comes, let's say, John was there also, behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, and then also hear that Jesus said, the Son of Man shall be delivered, he shall be condemned, he shall be crucified on the third day, he shall rise again. He also hears, I am the Lamb of God, and all that, if the corn of feet doesn't fall on the ground and dies, abide it alone. But if he falls into the ground and dies, bear much fruit. And he hears that great sermon, and Isaiah's follower says, no, Isaiah said that, and that is fulfilled in Isaiah, because he said it. It was like if it was David, they pierce my hands and my feet, I may count all my bones. It would be the same, let us put there also. David left, he died. Look, Jesus is the one who that prophet spoke of. No, it's David, because he said, they pierce my hands and my feet. But he died. No, then he has to resurrect, and they have to pierce his hands and his feet. It is the same thing being repeated at this end time. We could hear Brother Branham speak in first person, in second person, in third person. Brother William as well. But notice. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee of whom speaketh the prophet this, of himself or of some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. There he explained to him and told him everything. God opened the scriptures to this person, and you know the story there. Now notice, when that doesn't happen, then the other side is, the people stay with the human reasoning and human wisdom, which is of the devil. Notice on this page 11 of God's power to transform, he says, which it's all right to have wisdom, but if the wisdom is contrary, if the wisdom isn't correct wisdom from God, divine wisdom, and becomes natural wisdom, I don't care how much science we have and what more or education, it's of the devil. They start saying, such a eloquent words and things, human wisdom, human education, which doesn't take them anywhere. In other words, earthly education, earthly wisdom, not divine revelation, because they are not people who have prophetic insight. That is the great difference between divine wisdom and earthly wisdom one from God and the other one from the devil. I'll prove it to you, the Lord willing, in a few minutes. It's of the devil. Civilization is of the devil. I just got through preaching on that. All culture in the earth, all power of science and everything is of the devil. And he writes, Wisdom, Education, Civilization. Brother William there, all that belongs to the devil. It's his gospel he preached of knowledge in the Garden of Eden. And he has took that knowledge, perverted knowledge, contrary to the word and will and plan of God. 
And now he has had 6,000 years to do just exactly what God did, only in a perverted way, and took the same amount of time to bring his own Eden in. Now he has got an Eden here on earth, and is filled with wisdom and knowledge. That was his gospel at the beginning, knowledge, wisdom, science. Never did God ever cater to such. I want you to watch a minute. He did this, and because that he was a man of worldly wisdom. Our brother William continues saying, anyone may think, was Brother Branham mistaken? No. It is because everything has its time. He was the messenger of the seventh church age but he also reflected the messenger of the seventh dispensation. And when he stands to speak, anointed by the Holy Spirit, as the messenger of the seventh dispensation, he will speak things that will be fulfilled not in him, but in the messenger of the seventh dispensation. But when he stands to speak as the messenger of the seventh age, well, he says that that fourth Elijah is the messenger of the seventh church age, of the Lodisian age, of the third generation. Now notice, when he stands and speaks as a messenger of the seventh dispensation, he says, well, he's going to say things that will be fulfilled in that messenger of the seventh dispensation. And likewise, the same thing happened with our brother William Soto Santiago. Now notice. In this writing, for example, notice here a place where he writes, The seventh seal is opened, and the mighty angel that descends from heaven in him shall be opened, while the seventh angel is on earth in the half hour of silence. If it is in the half hour of silence, then it has to be a messenger that is on earth when Revelation 10, when it's that the angel, when Christ leaves the throne of intercession, takes the book, opens it in heaven, brings it to earth, and gives it to a man. To whom? To the seventh dispensational angel. But anyone may say, but he said that he had that title deed and that he was speaking the thunders and all of that. He was standing there in the place of that seventh dispensational angel who in the last day would be receiving the mighty angel, the second coming of the Lord, and that angel would be giving him the title deed and that instrument taking the title deed and not only taking it, but eating it in the half hour of silence because that happens within the half hour of silence which had not happened before. And that seventh dispensational angel had to be on earth so that at that time of the half hour of silence God would fulfill the work of the seventh seal, the work of giving the faith to be transformed in rapture, the rapture in faith. Brother Branham said that it will take the seven thunders to wake her up. We haven't had a revival yet. There hasn't been any revival yet. It will take those seven thunders to wake her up. He will send it. He promised it. On page 251, the bread hasn't had a revival yet. See, there have been no revival there. No manifestation of God to steer the bride yet. See, we're looking for it now. He'll take those seven unknown thunders back there to wake her up again. See, yeah, he'll send it. He promised it. Now, 
Now notice how. Notice here also, he says that the seventh angel will be on earth when that seventh seal is open and the mighty angel coming down from heaven, he says, in him shall be open while the seventh angel is on earth in the half hour of signing. Now notice on page 109 in the book of the seals, here the seventh angel so that you may see one of the places where he puts himself standing as he says there, standing to speak. In other words, standing. He stands to speak anointed by the Holy Spirit as messenger of the seventh dispensation. Notice where we are going to see him. One of the occasions, standing as if he was the seventh dispensational messenger. Page 109 of the Book of the Seals. Talk about a jubilee. And he writes, 50th year of Jubilee. Talk about a time when that Lamb walked forth. See, the book is even sealed in heaven. The mysteries are. Say, is my name there? I don't know. I hope it is. But if it is, it was put on the book before the foundation of the world. But the first thing that represented that redemption come the Lamb that had been slain from the foundation of the world. And he took the book, glory, opened the book and tore off the seal and sent it down to the earth to his seventh angel to reveal it to his people. And he writes, there he draws a star of David and the cornerstone and the ages and an arrow toward the cornerstone. And in this book of the seals, there he writes, where he says, and send it down to the earth to his seventh angel to reveal it to his people. He writes, seventh dispensational angel. And there you can see one of the many occasions where Brother Branham spoke. And when he spoke in that way, is that he was standing as he was the seventh dispensational angel. And anyone may say, but then everything was being fulfilled in him, and he was the one who the title deed was given. God was showing all that through that messenger, what God would be doing when he would rise from the throne of the Father, take the title, open it, and give it to a man, to eat it. And in another Bible study, he also writes, the seventh angel will be on earth in the time of the coming of the mighty angel. Which seventh angel? The seventh dispensational angel. And he writes, Revelation 10, 1 to 11, 11, 1 to 19. Who is it? The ministry of the two olive trees. The ministries of Moses and Elijah to whom the angel of the covenant would be operating those ministries because the Holy Spirit is the one who operates ministry. Now notice what he continues saying here also in the book of the 70th week of Daniel. Notice on page 20 it says on page 20 it says, I understand by letters of the prophets that Israel will become a nation. They reestablish the temple worship. God will go to dealing with her again when she comes to her homeland. Oh, two prophets will rise in the last day. And there he draws a cornerstone and the ages, and toward the cornerstone. In the last days with them. I understand that. Just as the Gentile church moves out, two prophets will arrive, Elisha and Moses, to Israel. We'll get it as we go through. And he writes, Elisha and Moses. Now, our brother William continues to say here, and in the third generation, the judgment for the kingdom of the Gentiles could not come. But in this fourth generation, 
the generation of the word of the age of the cornerstone, it will come. But first, our transformation will come. Our entrance into the promised land of the new, eternal, immortal, incorruptible, and glorified body, and our going away with Christ to the marriage supper of the Lamb. In the message, the interlace of a new day, preached on July 5, 1996, in Santa Fe, Bogota, it said, Apparently, it seems that the date of the rapture of the transformation of rapture and resurrection apparently is delayed. I say apparently because from the numbers that our brother Branham gave, and perhaps for many people, like the dates have passed and what brother Branham thought had not happened. That is what those that followed the message of brother Branham thought. But notice, a new age and a new dispensation has intertwined, has begun. See that dispensational interlay. And the work of that new age and of that new dispensation must be carried out for the dead in Christ to resurrect and for us who are alive to be transformed. Now notice, that work of that interlay notice the things or at least one of the writings that he writes there in the study I think we recently read it this writing he says the permanent everlasting peace will be announced by Elisha now notice That is why some may see Elijah, others may see the ministry of Moses, others may see the ministry of Jesus working in some of the prophets because God is the one who operates ministries through the Holy Spirit. And he may be operating the ministry and then look, when he says that he will be the second Moses, one of the two olive trees, and he himself says, because he's not going to be saying the same thing all times in the different ministries. He comes to say, well, if we count the ministry of Jesus, which is a dispensational ministry, then we would have to say it's one of the two olive trees. The ministry of Moses would be then the third. If we don't count it, then it would be the second. The Elijah, if we count the Reverend William Branham as the fourth, and the ministry of Elijah as one of the two olive trees, which is the fifth Elijah, where he has been mentioned in all the messages as the fifth Elijah, then it will be the fifth Elijah. But then if we count Jesus where all the ministries were, what number would it be? The sixth. But if we come to see that Elijah preaching the everlasting peace, then it will be the seventh. See? We can't. There is no problem in that. You can say the number you are most comfortable with. Two, three, because it's always the same God operating that ministry. And the important thing is that you see that ministry working, whether it is the second Moses as one of the two olive trees, or whether it is the third Moses, whichever way you want to look at it. As long as you see that it's the ministry of Moses and the ministry of Elijah, that settles the issue of the numbers for you. We cannot stumble over that and make an issue, that is, make a problem of that. Rather, it is about seeing the work of God, the fulfillment of what God promised. Notice, the permanent everlasting peace will be announced by Elijah and established by the Messiah, the Christ, the Anointed One, a man who will come anointed with the Holy Spirit. And he writes, will be born on earth and will be a Jew. That's why he told me, tell them what tribe you are from. And since all that, later we will be seeing the descendants we come from. And there we will realize, for sure, when we get to be transformed, no wonder it was being fulfilled that way. And it was just as it was spoken. 
a man who will come anointed with the Holy Spirit. And he writes in between, will be born on earth. So he has to be born, has to grow in order to carry out that work and to bring that promise to fulfillment. Will be born on earth and will be a Jew, he said, who will come anointed with the Holy Spirit. That is the Prince of Peace who will destroy the Antichrist and will establish his kingdom with his capital in Jerusalem, which will be the restored kingdom of David and in the throne of David, the Messiah. For Judaism, for Christianity and Islam, it will be Jesus coming, destroying the Antichrist and establishing his kingdom and bringing peace and happiness. Our brother William continues saying, so nothing is delayed, nothing is delayed, and if anyone comes to think that the dates given by our brother Branham have not been fulfilled, well look, if we look up those dates, something happened in our age and in our dispensation, and what happened is enough to not let the things that our brother Branham spoke fall to the ground in the message as the eagle steereth her nest, page 14 and 15, it tells us. We try to bring the message of the supernatural, of the vision of our heart, that is telling us of the end time being at hand. But the modern church rejects it, as did Lot's kingfolk. People laugh and make fun of the supernatural just as Lot's kingfold laughed and made fun of him. I have noticed, too, that here are some preachers who will not preach the message of his soon coming. They will bypass this important subject, or they will pass it off to their followers that it is for the next generation after them. Notice, he says that, Here are some preachers who will not preach the message of his soon coming. In other words, there will also be people who will say, no, that will be later on. That is not being fulfilled as it is being preached. But the fact is that this is, I believe with all of my heart, the last generation, and God has come down from glory to baptize the church with his power. And there he draws a cornerstone and the ages, and he writes, generation. And here on page 21, he also draws a cornerstone and the ages, and he writes 50 above the cornerstone. Jesus said, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And the next verse, the sign shall follow them that believe. Look at it in the face of what it is worth. What other generation has received this light and brought forth these works of God since the days of the early church? The early church had this same ministry. Then the long dark ages started, and now the end is at hand, and the words of Jesus are burnt into the heart of the people again. For he said, Go ye into all nations and preach the gospel unto every creature. And when he, this is done, then shall the end time be. Can't you see that God's church is being endued with power as it was when it began? His sons are going forth with the message of grace and mercy and deliverance. And the sign the Bible spoke of are following them, as well as appearing in the heaven. Anyone with an ounce of spiritual insight can see for themselves that this is the generation that will fulfill God's word. Now notice what he says there, this generation. There it didn't happen. It wasn't fulfilled. He was showing there what would take place in the generation in which that promise would be fulfilled. There he would be speaking and placing a type and figure 
of what that coming generation would be. Now notice the generation he's speaking about there, he writes there, the generation 1946-1986. Now, that combined with what is there in the great warrior Joshua complements what he writes there. about what Brother Branham spoke in the 70th week of Daniel. Let us turn there a moment. Page 22 in the book of the 70th week of Daniel. Now, do you understand the class? If we can find out what these 70 weeks are, we know when the consummation is. Oh my, God help us to know it. It tells us exactly somewhere in these pages. Exactly from that time till this time, until the consummation, and he won't miss it one minute. How God's great word. That will not fail, Brother William says there. And further down, it says, and if we can find these days, we'll find exactly when the consummation will be. Do you get it? It's determined to the consummation. And he writes, the consummation, the date will not fail. The date will not fail. Now, let us see something here. On page... Maybe we're getting a little sidetrack. But it is all manna. In other words, let us see what he wants to show us here. Notice, on page 429 in the Book of the Seals, now, here in the time of the tribulation period, just before this, it says, Now, when he was about to deliver his only begotten son, which was his only begotten, Jacob is his son, but this is his only begotten son. Matthew 27, let's see what he did there. Matthew, the 27th chapter, now. Remember, his son had been beaten and had been troubled, and they had made fun of him, and he was now hanging on the cross at 3 o'clock on Good Friday afternoon. And he writes, 3 p.m. he died. Now from the sixth hour there was darkness. And he writes, 12 p.m. Over all the land unto the ninth hour. And he writes, 3 p.m. Remember that Joseph came out in the eleventh hour. On one of the occasions where he went before his brothers. Now, notice just exactly what he did back here now in this, see? That is in Matthew 27, 45. Now, let us see what Revelation 6, 12 says right away. And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal. 
and he writes to the Jews, There was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. Blackness, darkness, Egypt, blackness, darkness. God delivering Jesus at the cross just before he brought him up from the resurrection. First, darkness. Sun went down in the middle of the day, and stars wouldn't shine. Two days from then, he was going to raise him up with a mighty triumph. After the sun and moon and stars and everything in Egypt, all this taken place, he delivered Israel to the promised land. Here it is, in the time of tribulation period, and here stands the prophet to whom has the control of the word that God gives them. They can only speak as God gives them the word. And there on top he writes, Adopted Ministries of Mount Zion. Moses and Elijah have the title deed. Remember that they have given it to him. They have given him the title already. Now, they're no God. They're temporarily, amateurly, they are. Because Jesus said they were. Say, you call them gods who the word of God came. But look, that's the ones that God brings the word to. God brings his word. God gives them or gave them. By that moment, he already gave them the title. Remember that the title deed, the book of the seven seals, is an abstract book. But look, that's the one that God brings the word to. And when he speaks it, it happens, that's all. And here he's with a commission from God to smite the earth. Whatever he wants to, oh my, stop the heavens. And he does. What's the matter? And there he draws the star of David. And he also writes, they spoke as God gave them his word. He is fixing to take the 144,000 out for a redemption, out of the book of redemption. In other words, they are written in the Lamb's book of life. Now notice that he speaks there about how that would be happening. He says, now in the time of the tribulation. But later on, he says that this happens before the tribulation begins. Because that ministry would be working beforehand in the fulfillment of the third pool, which is for the bride, for the foolish, for the lost, and for the 144,000. In other words, the 144,000 will see and say, this is the one we are waiting for. They will see him. The 144,000 will see him in the midst of the church. And notice, he says, and that's under the seal of redemption in the sixth seal. That is, my dear friend, that's that sixth seal, being so mysteriously. And he writes, the sixth seal equals the seal of redemption. And he writes, the 144,000 are in the book of redemption. In other words, they are written in the Lamb's book of life. Now, Our brother William continues to say here, so none of us think that our brother Branham was wrong. Just as all of you can calculate number, date, add, multiply, he did it as well. And according to what he saw and thought, he saw that by a certain time, certain things had to be fulfilled. Well, notice for 77, things that he saw have been fulfilled. There are others that have been held back because the chosen ones are not yet transformed. 
For example, the literal destruction of North America with atomic bombs, let us say, with a war. That has not been fulfilled, and thank God for that, because it would have affected all of Latin America and also our brothers who are there in North America. And why do you want, for example, those who have followed the message of our brother Branham but have not seen this other part of God's program? for that of the destruction of North America to be fulfilled already? Because if they were not transformed, it would have destroyed them as well. So thanks to God, the destruction of North America has not yet been fulfilled, but it will be fulfilled once we are transformed. That is why we are working so that the group of the chosen ones is completed because no one of them can perish. So therefore, we can see all these things that are promised for the last day. Perhaps our brother Branham did not understand things that correspond to our age because the prophet, for example, of the Old Testament who prophesied did not understand the things that would happen in the New Testament. But they prophesied of those things even though they didn't understand them. And even, and this is important, because notice they spoke being inspired by the Spirit of God, by the Holy Spirit. The prophets who prophesied of the grace spoke. Let us see, that is in First Peter or Second Peter. Second Peter, chapter 1, verse 21. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. In other words, they were inspired to speak of all that, and perhaps many of them did not understand what God would be fulfilling in the New Testament like Isaiah when he spoke in that chapter 53 like David himself like Malachi and all of them they spoke being inspired by the Holy Spirit and perhaps they did not understand why they were speaking those things as well as Brother Branham maybe didn't understand many things. Speaking from the dispensation of grace, and perhaps he did not understand things that were going to be fulfilled in the dispensation of the kingdom. And he says, and even when they prophesied of the coming of the Messiah, they all thought that he was only one, and they could not understand that from the first part of the coming of the Lord, which is the first coming of Christ, to the second part, which is the second, there was a period of time of certain number of years for the calling of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ and to complete the number of the elect, written in the Lamb's Book of Life since before the foundation of the world. In other words, there is a period of time, and they did not understand it. And when Christ reads in Isaiah 61, notice, if you look in your Bibles, there is a comma there. In those times, for sure, there was maybe not a comma. Maybe, I do not know what was there, but he stopped there. If there was not one, there was, because Jesus put it there. And to continue, about 2,000 years have to elapse to continue. So we can see these things, and we can then understand that there are things that the prophets of the Old Testament and the seven angel messengers, notice Brother Branham is there as well. Although they spoke of those things that will come for the last day, they could not fully understand them. Although they could see them in the Scripture, in their visions and all these things, but they could not understand them, fully understand them. Because that is for the elect of the last day of the age of the cornerstone and dispensation of the kingdom. To whom is it given to know all that? 
to us, to the chosen ones of God of the dispensation of the kingdom of the age of the cornerstone, to us. It is given to know those mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. In the message, what is the Holy Ghost? Tells us on page 15. It says, Luther walk in one light. Wesley walk in another. Wesley walk in one light. Pentecost walk in another. But we are walking on a higher than that today. And if there is another generation, you go beyond us. And he just a cornerstone in the ages. And Pentecost walk in one light in an arrow toward the bottom part of the seventh age. And in, if there is another generation, you'll go beyond us. There is an arrow toward the cornerstone. Back in the early days, when the thing was wide, way wide, Luther taught justification by faith. That was just to bring the people from Catholicism into Protestantism, into the fellowship around the world. Justification by faith. That was a big wide sphere. They never moved from that. Along came another revival called John Wesley. It shook them down from that and brought her down to sanctification, live a good, clean, holy life, sanctified by the Word of God, give joy in your heart. That shook off a lot of Lutheran doctrine. Then along came Pentecost with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And there he draws the ages at the bottom and the last three and an arrow toward the seventh age and narrowed it down again by receiving the Holy Ghost because it's narrowing on top. That's right. And now that's begun to shake down and the gift and the restoration and the Spirit of God has come in in the fullness of signs and wonders into the church and has shook the Pentecost. What is it? We are so close to the coming of the Lord Jesus unto the very spirit that was in him is working in the church. Doing the very same things that he did when he was here on earth. It's never been anywhere back from the time of the apostles till this time. Why? See it? Why? Narrows, narrows, narrows. What is it? Just like your hand coming to a shadow. That is, it adjusts until it reaches and sticks to the shadow. The negative, negative, negative. But what is it? It's a reflection. What was Luther? A reflection of Christ. What was Wesley? A reflection of Christ. And he draws a cornerstone and all the ages. And he writes, Christ was reflected in each messenger to how he would be in the age of the cornerstone. And in each age, he reflected what the age of the cornerstone would be. And there he draws a little stone. Notice, each messenger reflected to how he would be, that is the Messiah, the Anointed One, the fulfillment of his coming in the age of the cornerstone. All things under heaven have their time, and we are in the time of the fulfillment of everything that was spoken from Genesis because the seven seals, Brother Branham says, has been announced since Genesis. Everything spoken by the prophets of the Old Testament, everything that Jesus spoke, everything that the apostles spoke, everything that Paul spoke, the seven angel messengers, everything that the Reverend William Branham spoke, everything that our beloved brother William Soto Santiago spoke in his message that he brought us, all that 
we are now seeing it face to face in its fulfillment. That is why when Jesus appeared back then, he didn't have to bring a message. The message was himself, his presence, because he was the fulfillment of what the prophet had spoken and prophesied, of what has been spoken of him, of what the fulfillment of his coming in his first coming would be. And all that the Reverend William Branham spoke, which is the message that foreshadows the second coming of the Lord, the chosen one must be watching and searching the message of Brother Branham and the message of Brother William to see the fulfillment of what was prophesied and foreshadowed what the coming of the Lord, the coming of the Son of Man with his angels would be, which is in fulfillment. All things under heaven have their time, and we are at the time of the preaching of the thunders, the rapturing faith in the tenth vision, being fulfilled in this end time. Let us stand up, and thus we leave with this subject, all things under heaven have their time. We leave our beloved brother and friend, Dr. William Soto Santiago.